orbital flight timeline announced NASA on Starship's moon mission. Yesterday's Falcon 9 launch. Hello everyone, welcome back. Here is our new episode with latest SpaceX and space news. So, let's get started. So, we have now covered the post-launch conditions of the entire launch pad. Now let's discuss how close we are to the orbital flight test of the next Starship Super Heavy. But before directly addressing that question, let's carefully evaluate the current scenarios step by step. If my information is correct, the next Starship prototype for the flight would be Ship 28, and Booster 10 would be the Super Heavy prototype. Just yesterday, Booster 11 arrived at the production site after undergoing cryo-testing at Massey's. It's worth noting that Booster 10 has already passed this milestone and is just awaiting a static fire when the orbital launch mount, OLM, is ready to host it. I anticipate that B-10 may be at the OLM within the next two weeks. SpaceX has promptly placed it onto the engine installation stand in Mega Bay. As for Ship 28, heat shield tiles have already been installed, and it is now set to undergo a testing campaign. We might see SpaceX testing Ship 28 very soon, especially since they don't need to prepare the suborbital pads for that. Testing could easily take place on one of the existing test stands, in the meantime, refurbishments on the OLM and ground system are underway, and construction of the suborbital side wall is in progress. I'm curious if there will be any modifications to the ship or booster following the orbital flight of S-25 and B-9. SpaceX is currently analyzing the collected data, and we may see changes in the coming days. Regarding the FAA's involvement, after the orbital flight of S-25 and Booster 9, the FAA shared, a mishap occurred during the SpaceX Starship OFT-2 launch from Boca Chica, Texas on Saturday, November 18th. The anomaly resulted in a loss of the vehicle. No injuries or public property damage have been reported. The FAA will oversee the SpaceX-led mishap investigation to ensure SpaceX complies with its FAA-approved mishap investigation plan and other regulatory requirements. For me, it appears to be primarily a SpaceX investigation with FAA oversight, presumably involving discussions and agreement on license requirements, restrictions, and offsets. Elon Musk shared his timeline for OFT3, stating, Starship Flight 3 hardware should be ready to fly in three to four weeks. There are three ships in final production in the high bay, as can be seen from the highway. These three ships are Ship 30, 31, and 32, currently undergoing preparation works inside the high bay. Given the current scenario, the best guess for OFT3 is within February. However, the FAA's timeline remains uncertain, something neither SpaceX nor we can predict. From SpaceX's side, it is expected that they will prepare both Ship 28 and Booster 10 within two months, including the completion of all testing. The pace at which SpaceX is moving is extremely mind-blowing. Following OFT-1, they had to make around 1,000 changes to the entire Starship system, including some to the launch pad, which took several months to prepare for OFT-2. FAA and FWS also played a significant role in the delay, conducting a thorough investigation into the first anomaly, considering all aspects of wildlife around the Boca Chica area. That's a quick update on the entire OFT3 timelines. Feel free to share your thoughts. I love reading your comments as it makes me feel like I'm virtually with like-minded people. Also, do subscribe and turn on the notification bell as I am uploading detailed episodes every single day, so you won't miss it. Now let's move to other updates. So, an official from NASA recently stated that the use of Starship Super Heavy for Artemis lunar landings will require in the high teens of launches, a significantly higher number than what SpaceX's leadership had previously claimed. During a presentation at a meeting of the NASA Advisory Council's Human Exploration and Operations Committee on November 17th, Lakeisha Hawkins, Assistant Deputy Associate Administrator in NASA's Moon to Mars Program Office, emphasized that SpaceX will need to perform Starship launches from both its current pad in Texas and one under construction at the Kennedy Space Center. 
This is crucial for sending a lander to the moon for Artemis III. SpaceX's concept of operations for the Starship Lunar Lander, part of the Human Landing System, HLS program, involves multiple launches of the Starship Super Heavy System. The process includes placing a propellant depot into orbit, followed by several launches of tanker versions of Starship to transfer propellants into the depot. Subsequently, the lander version of Starship will rendezvous with the depot, fill its tanks, and head to the moon. The exact number of launches required has been a point of debate since Starship selection by NASA for the first HLS award in 2021. Hawkins mentioned it's in the high teens in the number of launches, driven by concerns about boil-off, the loss of cryogenic liquid propellants, at the depot. To meet the required schedule and manage boil-off, there needs to be a rapid succession of launches. This schedule will necessitate launches from both the existing Starship pad at Boca Chica, Texas, and the one SpaceX is constructing at KSC's launch complex 39A, adjacent to the current pad used for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches. Hawkins mentioned a six-day rotation for launches from both sites. Critics of NASA's selection of Starship for HLS have highlighted the number of launches as a weakness in the architecture. The Government Accountability Office, in rejecting protests by Blue Origin and Dynetics of the Starship HLS Award in 2021, noted that SpaceX required 16 launches for a Starship Lunar Lander mission. Elon Musk disagreed, calling the need for 16 launches extremely unlikely in an August 2021 social media post. He suggested a max of 8 inches tanker launches and even as few as 4. Development of the Starship lander is considered critical for the Artemis III mission. However, Jim Free, Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, noted that there are various factors at play, including new spacesuits and the addition of a docking port on Orion. Yes, the lander is absolutely important, we can't go anywhere without it, but we also can't go anywhere without the suits. These comments were made a day before the scheduled launch of the second integrated Starship Super Heavy vehicle, designated OFT-2. Feel free to share your thoughts. The successful Falcon 9 launch on the West Coast marked the culmination of the 55th Starlink delivery mission for the year. The rocket, lifting off from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, followed a trajectory heading southeast, aiming for a specific orbit of 183 by 178 miles at an inclination of 53 degrees to the equator. This particular Falcon 9 had been fueled for the second time, with the previous attempt on early Sunday morning halted just minutes before liftoff. SpaceX communicated a standing down decision about seven minutes after the scheduled liftoff time, providing no specific reason for the delay. The Starlink 7, Seven mission had already faced a one-day delay and several reschedules from its initial launch time of 10.33 p.m. PST, finally targeting the last launch opportunity of the night. The first stage booster, completing its 15th flight, had an impressive resume, having supported missions such as Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, DART, Transporter-7, Iridium-1 Web, the Space Development Agency Tranche Zero B missions, and nine prior Starlink delivery missions. Following its burn, the first stage executed a successful landing on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. Stationed about 400 miles downrange in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California. Approximately an hour post-launch, SpaceX confirmed the deployment of the 22 V2 Mini Starlink satellites through a social media post. These V2 Mini satellites, introduced earlier this year, stand out for their larger size compared to the V1. Five satellites. With upgraded antennae and larger solar panels, these advanced models offer four times the bandwidth of their predecessors. In a recent announcement, SpaceX disclosed that it had exceeded 2 million subscribers in over 60 countries for its Starlink internet service, underscoring the growing global demand for reliable satellite-based internet connectivity. So that's all about today's episode. See you tomorrow, and until then goodbye.